Hey guys, it's Thane Bishop. Uh, a few days ago, I put out a community post asking if people would have any interest in seeing a director commentary style video for the Cyberpunk 2077 and Loving World That Hates You video, and it garnered uh, some attention and some interest, so I figured it might be a fun little project to do while I have some downtime, and I could maybe use it to kind of roll a few ideas all up into one video. But first, let's start with the actual process of making that video. So there are three different programs that I use. Um, the first of which is on screen right now, OBS. OBS is an open source, free to use program uh, for recording video software, or I guess it is a video recording software. Um, use it for gameplay, use it for whatever you're trying to record on screen on a computer. Um, it's also good for streaming. I've never used it for streaming. Um, I know it's what people used to use for streaming. I believe Twitch has their own kind of like Twitch Studios program at this point that some people might have switched off to, so I'm not totally certain on the status of using OBS for streaming, but for recording, it's a really good program. I'm sure there are better programs out there, but for it being free and open source, that is a huge, huge win uh, for me with where I'm at right now in the status of me making these videos. Secondly, I use a program called I use a program called Audacity. This is what I use to record the audio for the video. So all of the like sort of uh, commentary over the video clips you guys would have heard in the Cyberpunk video. This is the program I use for it. It looks a little bare bones and a little outdated from its uh, aesthetic, but in terms of its actual functionality, it does everything I need it to do at my current level of experience and. Uh, the things I'm using it for. So I'm perfectly happy with this. And again, this is another free and open source program um, for audio recording. So if you're doing uh, video commentary, if you're doing podcasts, if you're doing, I don't know, voiceover for anything, this program is a really good way of getting started with that kind of idea. And then finally, to compile everything, I use a program called Shotcut. This is, again, free, open source. Everything I use is free and open source. So if you're interested in doing something similar or just kind of getting started in video production, video editing, uh, audio, whatever, these three programs, uh, I'll link in the description below, are really, really good ways of getting started and just trying stuff out. They're not necessarily the best, uh, again, free and open source, but it's hard to beat the level of just... I mean, it's free, you know, it's a free way of figuring out if this kind of stuff is interesting to you um, or if it's fulfilling and it's a nice starting point. And because they're all free and open source, there's a lot of online tutorials and stuff. Um, a lot of what I've learned how to use Shotcut 4 came off the back of uh, tutorials from people online being incredibly helpful and generous with their time. Uh, and together, those are the three programs I used to record... I think it's like 230, yeah, it's 241 gigabytes of footage um, of just uh, apparently a little bit of Valheim, but mostly cyberpunk. I uh, recorded this over, I think it's like around 120 hours if you go in and you add up all of the, um, no, 120 hours, that's not right. Uh, it's around 80 hours, I think, if you go in and add up kind of all of the different bulk videos I have and then all the little clips and stuff like that. I tried to, as I got closer and closer to the end of the project, keep the videos a little shorter because they're easier to edit. Um, for example, Cyberpunk Bulk number three was like three and a quarter hours long, which is just too much. Um, but I would do all of these and then I had a, a journal next to me on my desk and I would just keep track like this is bulk number three. And then when a clip happened that might be useful in the future or mentioned something about, you know, Night City in the way that I was looking for, I would just take a timestamp um, in my journal, physically write that out. And then as I was editing, I would just look at what I had um, available to me. And then I would I would have Shotcut open on two monitors. Um, Shotcut on the main monitor here would have like kind of the living working file that I was working out of. And then um, I would have a second Shotcut uh, program open on my second monitor. And that would be like the, the uh, clip that I was working with. So I would open up like Cyberpunk Bulk number three, go to the timestamp, cut the time, uh, cut the clip that I wanted, and then copy paste it into the living working file. Um, I'm sure there's a better way of doing it, but it's the way that ended up working for me. And when you're doing a project like this, sometimes the thing that works is the thing you do, even if it's not necessarily the best way of getting the job done. But those are the three programs. 
Um, I'll link them below in the description, but OBS also comes from obsproject.com, Shotcut from shotcut.org, and Audacity, Audacity, Audacity from audacityteam.org. Just a quick shout out to the programs that made this video possible. And then in addition to all of the programs that I use, uh, what with this being a director's commentary and whatnot, I figure an appropriate thing to do would be to watch the video with you guys. And I can sort of pause at different points and we can talk about the process behind the video itself, uh, the motifs and themes I was trying to hit, and some things that people have brought up in the comments of that video that might be worth uh, discussing in terms of uh, maybe not having the exposure in the video that it might have deserved. So with that in mind, let's uh, get going. Around 30 hours into my first playthrough of Cyberpunk 2077, I made a bit of a discovery. If you look at the map for the world, there's a bunch of little icons. You've got a ripper dock here, an arms dealer there, a person to offer you work scattered around each of the city's districts. And sprinkled in between all of them is these little blue dots. Somebody brought up a really great point that I kind of biffed on my explanation, is that if you hover over these blue dots, it does literally say fast travel right here. Um, so like, how did I miss that these were fast travel points? And the honest answer is I actually didn't use the map very much while I was playing those first 30 hours. Um, I was pretty story focused. I tend to do that on my first playthrough of any game, especially when the game kind of has a, I guess, sort of internal deadline. Like you've got this, you've got this biochip in your brain. You need to get it figured out quick. I don't have time. Like, sorry, Judy, I don't have time. I have to, I'm going to die. You know, I got to go quick. So the way that I would get around the world is I would go to my journal um, and I would open up like the most important quest and I would just track the quest and then telling you um, where you are in specific and then I would just follow the mini map. That's all I would do. I, I, I didn't really pay it too much attention to the map of Night City for a long time. Um, and it wasn't until that three hour that I actually like looked at the map, knew all these corresponding dots. Like I know that this is like a drop off point, but I'd never been prompted to interact with any of these blue dots before. So what are these? Um, so I maybe should have gotten a little bit more in depth with like how I missed that these were fast travel points, because once you even just hover over them, it's super obvious that this is fast travel. But I think part of the commentary here is I wasn't looking for fast travel. I, I didn't know it existed because I didn't care to find it. Neat. But around that aforementioned 30 hour mark, I noticed that these little blue icons actually existed in the world too, and they were always accompanied by these weird little box things. I finally got curious and approached one to see what this box thing was, thus learning that they're fast travel spots, and that fast travel is a thing. And I didn't feel annoyed or frustrated or anything like that by not finding out fast travel exists in Night City until 30 hours in, which for someone like me is kind of abnormal. I mean, I've played The Witcher 3, which has- The Witcher 3 is another game made by the same company, so I thought it was a really natural uh, place to start here, um, because their fast travel system is super, um, Super similar, right? It's instead of identical system. Sorry, hold on. For fast travel, that instead I of little blue boxes, it's these signposts that are kind of outside, often. kind of outside major areas. And this was a really great example because in the time it would take me to load from Wosung Bridge to Ford, I could literally have just get gotten on Roach and just ridden across this tiny little expanse. Um, but I didn't. I, that's not how I play these games as possible, and in Skyrim, my very first objective, even above meeting Balgra, One of my favorite shots. Um, it was kind of a little bit of a challenge to figure out how to sneak in a little bit of commentary, or commentary, a little bit of comedy in this video, because the overall theme of the cyberpunk video is pretty serious. Um, so how do you fit in jokes and stuff? And the answer is, you only use a few, and you make them really silly when you can is to carriage to every hold to make further exploration easier since no matter where I need to go after that I'll have at least something unlocked nearby. One thing I didn't mention is in like my most recent playthroughs of Skyrim I've even stopped using Bjorlum um, I, and I've started just using console commands. I play on PC as you can tell um, and so when I need to go to Iverstead for the first time it's literally just open the console command and then COC space like Iverstead exterior zero one. Um, and I know that's super lazy, but I'm just so tired. I've been, I've been doing this walk and being around Skyrim for God, 12 years now at this point. I know what the walk is. I know there's nothing there. I'm tired of being attacked by wolves every 13 seconds, you know? So just give me to where I'm going. Just give me the story and we'll be good. 
Hell, in ESO, the way shrines that allow for fast travel to different parts of the world are the only objective I ever actually cared about, because finding a new one meant less time in the future spent wandering around some dumb forest or trekking through miles of open sand to get to where I'm going. And I would happily pay Whoops! Okay, a hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's let's bring it let's bring it back down. I dumb forest or trekking through miles of open I actually wandered through this desert for like fifteen minutes trying to find a way shrine so I could do that like walking up to the way shrine and discovering it for the first time scene. And eventually I just called it and went to Aradon um to shoot that shot because I genuinely couldn't find a way shrine in this area. It was just it was just miles of open sand with nothing interesting going on. Um which sucks. And like, I love these games. I, I don't want to come across as if like, I don't like The Witcher or Skyrim or ESO. There's a reason, if I, if I pulled up my Steam library, um, ESO has like 500 hours. I've got like 200 hours in uh, each of the different Skyrim releases. I do like these games. I love them a lot. But I think one of the areas where they really fall short is their open world. And just in, in your effort to make the world feel big, I think you lose the ability to make the world feel full, you know? The world stops being interesting. And this works in some games. I think somebody in the comments of that Cyberpunk video made a great point about, like, a big, hollow, open world really works for something like Breath of the Wild, right? Where you're trying to present the world as this big, open, kind of abandoned expanse that is in its sort of twilight years, right? Like, the world, the, the world of Hyrule in Breath of the Wild is post-apocalyptic, so it kind of makes sense that a lot of the world is wild and untamed and there's not anything going on. But for a game like Skyrim, it just doesn't really work the same. So I love these games, but this is an area where it's in a stark contrast to the way Cyberpunk runs its world, and I think it really, really shows. Open sand to get to where I'm going, and I would happily pay a gold cost to portal to one whenever I wanted rather than just walk 35 seconds to find one in the world to use for free. But in Cyberpunk, I never even thought to use fast travel, never thought about its apparent absence, which is weird. But weirder still is that after 70 more hours, a near 100% complete second playthrough, and, you know, learning it's a thing, I still don't use fast travel to get around Night City. Even though I have such a history of relying on fast travel to get me around open world games, I've probably used it in Night City less than five times. And I think my distaste for fast traveling around Night City stems from this weird relationship I have with cyberpunk as a game and a genre and with Night City in general because I love this world. It's just, I don't know if I was supposed to. So that music comes in and I timed it in relation to this cutscene starting. I wanted the vocals to come in right as like my commentary goes out. And it just so happens that if you watch that back, the music actually starts the moment I get on the bike and it kind of imitates um, like the radio system that Cyberpunk uses. But what's really cool about that is that was totally by accident. I did not splice that footage in any such way that, you know, music starts when you get on the bike and then vocals start when the cutscene starts. Um, I just got super fucking lucky on that one, and uh, I, I kind of honestly edited the rest of the audio around it because I didn't want to lose that correlation that I liked a whole lot. I'm going to turn it down and kind of talk over this. Um, I love this scene. I, I pondered for a little while how to kind of get the point across of, like, I love this world, I don't think I'm supposed to, and I, I ended up settling on this because I don't really know if there was a better example of, like, carjacking being met with essentially execution by SWAT team, none of this is proper, right? None of this is right. Like, yes, these are bad guys, but this is the wrong response. And the fact that the guy getting carjacked, the, the Max Tech ends up just exploding the car. So the guy still loses his car. Everyone loses here. But that's just what Night City is. Cyberpunk opens with you choosing something called your character's lifestyle. You get three different options, from Nomad to Street Kid to Corpo, and honestly I would give you a little description of what these terms mean, but 90% of the description is already in the term. I actually did, in the original cut of the script, have a whole like paragraph or two for each of these um, descriptions, and then I realized it was just going to be way too much information. Right, because the video is supposed to be about like kind of the relationship, the troubled relationship you have with Night City, not necessarily 
a history of the game and its world. Um, and it was just super convenient because, yeah, the honest truth is when you say that, oh, I'm a nomad or I'm a corpo, it's just like, yeah, you know what that means. The the titling of these lifestyles, uh, it's actually life path. That's one of the words I mispronounced in this video. It's super clear. My first playthrough of Cyberpunk, though, I chose the street kid lifestyle. It seemed right, kind of like a canon version of the game. Plus, I had just finished Edge Runners, so the inspiration was pretty strong. I think a lot of people that watched that video fell into the same category that I did, and it was interesting seeing the response from people that fell into that category of I've just finished Edge Runners, let's play the game, versus people who have been playing the game since day one. Um, there's a lot of difference, I think, in, in the way people feel about the game, because I think the people who've been playing it since launch... Like, I, I don't want to do this like as a reverse gatekeeping thing, but I'm just curious what my response would have been to Cyberpunk if I had been playing it since day one. Because one of the things I talk about in the outro is there was a lot of problems with the game come day one. And I think for the people who like actively played through that, I, I wonder just what the difference in relationship feels like, you know, because when, when I think about Night City, like, sure, it's a little buggy, but mostly it was just a really good story. As opposed to, I think, when you played it at the beginning of its lifespan and it was really buggy, but you still played through it anyways. I just, I wonder if there's a difference in relationship there. And when you start as a street kid, it's a pretty rough go. The whole story isn't ever explained, at least I never got all of it, but the impression I walked away with was that Street Kid V made a small name for themselves in Night City, and then bounced to Atlanta to find their fame and glory in earnest, only to come crawling back when things fall apart on them. And while they have a few old contacts to help get themselves back on their feet, they literally can't even steal a car, a very minor offense in this city by the way, without everything going wrong. But this is when we're introduced to Jackie, and when things finally start going right, represented by this very sweet cutscene that shows V moving in with Jackie and his mother, the equally sweet Mama Wells, V and Jackie learning to work together as a team for all sorts of work that the denizens of Night City need done under the table, and the scene concludes as V getting their feet back underneath them, getting their own place. I, uh, I show that cutscene kind of in part three different times with each of the life path introductions, and one thing I really tried to do was not show the same clip multiple times post that like move in bit. Um, because in the original sort of planning for this, I showed that cutscene in its entirety uh, three times. And in the original script, it had like the spacing for that. And it ended up just being too repetitive and too monotonous, right? And so I ended up cutting down the script around that part, and I ended up cutting down the footage around that part. And it actually, I think, really helped sell the repetitive nature of this world in a way that was more effective than just repeating the cutscene. Because it really sells this idea of like, you're doing this over and over and over again, right? It's happening ad nauseum. Um, you know what's happening at this point. You can it's it's muscle memory in a way. You don't need to see the cutscene. You know the cutscene. It's the same thing every time, and it really sells this idea of the repetition of it without actually having to use literal repetition. If you choose a different lifestyle, though, like Corpo, things are a little different. You start off working for someone who works for someone, but look, you're cyber deck. Make note, if you've never played the um, Corpo Life Path before, uh, this dude's name. His name is Arthur Jenkins. I'm going to mention him later in the video at a point, but just make note of that. That The, the guy you work for is uh, named Arthur Jenkins. Because all these stock readouts, and you have a lustrous office with a drawer full of drugs and an Easter egg. Classic Witcher 3 uh, <laughs> magazine. I love that it's retro gaming by that point. And you've got a prime side hustle as a fixer. What you also have, however, is a bunch of rival suits who have caught onto the shit your boss is trying to pull, and they've come to purge the department. One small thing, um, if you've ever played the Corpo Life Path, there's a dude, um, Frank, I believe is his name, that like calls you over as you're walking to Jenkins' office. He's he's right there. That's Frank, the guy you talk to who's like, oh, I just got back from like the Cape of Good Hope or whatever, uh, and I'm just in town for a week. That's him right there. And, and that means you, too. But this is when Jackie takes us in, represented by him helping us talk the suit goons out of their very worst ideas and starting a very sweet cutscene that shows V moving in with Jackie and his mother, V and Jackie doing all of that work stuff I mentioned, and V getting the keys to their own place. The Nomad start, again, gives a different perspective, starting with V giving up life with their old clan the backers and moving towards Night City in search of greener pastures. Now, a nomad alone in the world is a terrible thing, and terrible is about how well things are going for V. 
After being run out of the smallest town by a sheriff with the largest ego and being told not to contact his old friend from the backers ever again, V's first mission sans his family goes equally terrible, as not even a hefty bribe at the border can guarantee safety for a nomad on their own. Everything falls apart, with success only achieved by the slimmest margins. But this is when we really connect with Jackie, and, and well, I guess you know the rest by this point. Um, if you do the Nomad start and you look at the cargo in the back of the car, I don't know if it's the same lizard, but there's a lizard in there. Um, and the same type of lizard can later be found in the Arasaka suite at Kompeki Plaza when you go there. you can the, There's a lizard, you can grab its egg, for example, it's a little Easter egg that you can hatch and have a little pet lizard. Um, but my total headcanon is you are transporting the lizard you later then see in Kompeki Plaza. Because the crate is labeled Arasaka, and part of me wonders if, you know, um, Yorinobu threw a fixer, threw a friend, threw you, just wanted this rare animal for his penthouse suite. It's not some accident that every one of these stories converge at the same place. Um, if you pay attention to this shot, it's actually kind of overlaid. Each V enters exactly, I think, one frame or like one second after the other V. Because what I found is if I tried to have all three Vs come in to frame on the same beat, it ends up kind of just being this mass of bodies that you can't really differentiate. Um, so if you just offset it a little bit, it really kind of sells them coming together towards the part where V start uh, stops moving in the cutscene. And one fun thing, I actually had to shoot this scene twice because the first time I did it, I had like a stock male V for the street kid. I had a stock female V for Corpo, and then I had the same stock V for Nomad. And it ended up being really confusing because it looked like there were only two Vs in this shot when I had just shown all three lifestyles. So I actually had to go back and re-record the Nomad with just a different character. Every cyberpunk story is the same. And that's not a dig or a weak point of the game, but I think a core driving message about the world of Night City and the game uses these opening acts to display it. It's just, a place like Night City really only allows for one kind of story. This was a shot that I was super happy with, but I was also kind of nervous about whether or not the full, like, intent of the shot would come through. The idea of talking about, like, one kind of story as you and Jackie are literally walking in to the afterlife. Because the afterlife exists, you know, it's a bar, it's a physical thing within the world of Night City, but it's also this sort of metaphor for what's going on with the heist, because everyone involved in this heist technically dies. Uh, Dex is killed by Takamura, T-Bug is killed by somebody, it's never really quite clear who actually dispatches T-Bug. Uh, Jackie dies during the escape, and uh, V dies um, later. So technically everybody involved in this you know, heist dies, and there's the very real correlation of there's only one kind of story as you're getting ready to walk into, the, you're, you're literally and metaphorically walking into the afterlife with this heist job. There's this overarching theme, and it's not just about whether you pick Street Kid or Corpo, it hangs over every element of this world. Um, if you load up Cyberpunk, there's three of these blimps, I believe. Blimps, quote-unquote, just floating around Night City at all times. Um, and as far as I'm aware, they never land, they never go away, they're just always present in the city. So one of the th decisions I tried to make was the idea of correlating this oppressive nature of Night City, this idea that you'll hear in just a second of, you know, Night City doesn't want you to succeed and doesn't care if you survive the attempt of succeeding, that sort of ingrained idea of this world wants you to fail, this world wants to just chew you up and spit you out, I tried to ingratiate that with this idea of the blimps, because the blimps are this sort of overarching, it's always there, and any time in the video where I do like a wide shot of the city, I try and get one of these blimps in there as just a subtle kind of, hey, hey, don't forget, like, you're, it's not going to be good here. And it's a story that's told at the street side and back alleyways of Pacifica, all the way up to the top floor suite of the nicest joint in town. Even above the clouds, they aren't immune. Just ask. This is a shot that um, kind of relies on you having experience with the devil ending to play, which I think is... I, I mean, it's unanimously, I think, kind of the bad ending, and I think a lot of people don't go for it because it involves throwing away all of the people in your life and all of the, you know, ethics and morals that I think your time in Night City is supposed to teach you. But the basic it's idea behind it family. is that um, Yorinobu kills his father, Saburo, 
um, to like take control of the company, right? He's he's falling into that archetype of he's trying to reach higher than his station, right? He's trying to find something for himself that is not his, and in doing so, he he kills his father, only to be revealed at the very end of the game that his father had an engram of his mind created, and after you bring um, Yorinobu down, they just install his father's consciousness into him. And I don't know if that kills the son, or if that just turns um, Yorinobu into a silent passenger in his own body, but it's it's that same mirroring image. No matter where you are in Night City, this idea of you don't get more than you are, and you're lucky for having that. Because if you try to get more than you are, you are killed at best. Or at worst, you end up this terrifying silent passenger in your own body. And that's that's just Night City. Every cyberpunk story is the tale of desperately trying to be more than you are in a world that doesn't want you to succeed, doesn't care if you survive the attempt, and honestly would really rather prefer it if you didn't. I ended up doing the devil ending as kind of a last minute thought, just... Um, while I was getting some footage on this character. Um, and I thought, sure, I've never done the devil ending, let's try it out. And it ended up being super important, because that idea you just heard is kind of the thesis of this essay. That Night City is a world that doesn't want you to succeed, doesn't care if you succeed, and if it could, would prefer that you didn't survive the attempt, right? And there's this idea that you just saw presented of Hanako... Hanako doesn't even remember you. You essentially sacrificed everything, all of the people in your lives, your ethics, your morals. You sacrificed everything to help Hanako, and she doesn't even remember you. You were never important to Hanako. And it's, it would be really convenient for us if you just died right now and let us take your engram, right? Because you're, you were, you're, you're in too deep. They've forgotten you, but you're also in too deep. So if you just let us control your brain at this point, that would be really convenient for us. I came into this game knowing that Jackie dies. It still hit. It hits because the game makes it hit, and not just in some cheap bullshit way where Jackie starts talking a big game about how great everything is going to be after the heist job. You have to talk to his mom. You were there when he died, and she probably holds you at least partially responsible for the death of her son, but she loves you too and can't just blame you, and I don't know how to have that sort of conversation. You have to go to his funeral and figure out if it's a good idea to bring his girlfriend, but not quite girlfriend, along as well, because Mama Wells really doesn't like her, but fuck. Misty lost someone too. And then you have to go through his things and- I actually forgot about this while writing the script and doing the edits of like, technically, Jackie's Ofrenda is a totally optional thing. You don't have to do this. But I guess I would counter that point with, if you don't go to Jackie's funeral, what's what's wrong with you? <laughs> Try and decide which of these individual items represents the entirety of a human life that just wanted something more than the circumstances of his birth, as if you can just summarize that down to a single physical thing, but what else are you supposed to do in Night City? I typically choose the basketball. Somebody in the comments made a really great point of, I guess, sort of just wondering what the item you choose for Jackie Zafrenda says about you. Um, and I think that's a really cool thing to think about, because each of these items is Jackie, right? It's part of the raw absurdity of death, this notion of taking the entirety of a complex human life and summarizing it down to one physical thing, when in reality, if you actually wanted to represent Jackie, you would need every single one of those items in his garage, and probably more, because he's not just, you know, this stock 2D character. He's got depth, he's got layers, he's got these sexy pinups on his wall, but he's also got this incredibly intricate and emotional sand mandala that he made at the recommendation of Misty. He's a bit of a meathead with his weights and the fact that I think at one point he asks like an Arasaka guard um, or he asks some guard if they think they could take him. Um, so he's a bit of a meathead, but he also reads for who the bell tolls dozens of times. Um, you know, he loves street food. When we get uh, when he when he comes to get us and mention that our car is ready for pickup, he's just eating some like synth meat. But it's also revealed that he has this incredibly fine taste in tequila. And so he's he's not just this stock character. If you wanted to represent Jackie's in his entirety, you would need every single item and more, but that's just part of the absurdity of death. For me, I see Jackie, if I had to summarize him, as just this kid from Haywood that wanted more than the circumstances of his birth. So for me, the basketball makes a lot of sense. But I think if you see Jackie as this kind of stonewall fighter who refuses to give up on his principle and his morals, 
you know, damned the costs, then I think you take the belt. And I think your item is just what your desperate attempt at trying to turn a 3D person into a 1D object ends up being. Everything gets worse when Jackie dies, when you're left to pick up the pieces, when you can see immediately that Night City doesn't care about you or the people you think are in charge. You work for Dex, sure, and Dex is a big name on the streets at the time, but Dex is just a fixer. This is such a great bit, and I'm glad that it literally worked out this perfect. This idea of, like, if anybody wants to mess with you, they have to go through Dex to Sean. And it's implied that, like, Dex is a pretty... Dex is, was at least a big name a little bit ago, and it seems he's been on a bit of an upswing. But in terms of fucking... In terms of fucking through Dex to Sean's 300-pound uh, ass... care about fixers. Takamura is not phased. And it's this incredible line in the sand of, like... Dex is in charge of the streets, in a way, you know? He's a fixer, he's important. How do we highlight that the importance that Dex has means nothing, in actuality? And the fact that we looked up to Dex, we worked for Dex, we gave him our respect and our allegiance. So what does that say about us? And once you're on your own, you realize you're dying. And it's pretty bad. Anytime you cough up this much blood in the middle of a bar, you know you're in trouble, but when you cough up this much blood this many times... I love this little scene when you first meet Johnny in your apartment. It doesn't track through the rest of the game, but it's such a great way of showing that you're two minds in one body, that your visions of him are just your own dying brain trying to make sense of what's going on inside it. There are a few points where it does track. Um, for example, leaving the meeting with Hanako, that was the shot before this, um, when Johnny stops the elevator, he motions with his own hand, his own sort of like phantom hand, and you can see your hand actually press the button. And it is kind of a terrifying moment of seeing that in our weakened state, Johnny has more control over the body than we do. And once that happens, I guess you're never really on your own. You're just stuck with a washed up rocker boy terrorist that's slowly overriding your brain with his own, with neither of you having any real control over it besides the dichotomy of either taking pills to make the phantom shut up, or taking pills to kill yourself. Which honestly, some might consider worse than being on your own. At this point though, the game opens up in a huge way. The lockdown on the starting district is lifted, and you're now free to move about the entire city, although the game doesn't exactly expect you to explore all of it. There's loads, absolutely loads, of little gigs and side quests and small self-contained stories that have nothing to do with the plight of V and Johnny, but that you can place yourself in anyways. I'm... I think if I looked up... if I, if I pulled up my Steam, I'm at like 158 hours played in this game. And admittedly, you know, a few hours of those are just kind of wandering around getting footage for, you know, this video. But I, I've i only done all of the cyber psychos, right? So, like, all of just, like, the um, Wakako jobs, for example, or the Reyes jobs, I've, I've never completed all of those. There's still so much to this game in terms of just its side offerings that I haven't even touched yet. Pan Am and the Aldecardos have a huge side story, just like Judy and the Clouds crew do, but you only meet each of them for a single individual story mission. You only meet Judy because you need a BD tuned from someone Ev trusts, and Pan Am only gets introduced to help you grab Hellman, and after you get her car back so that you can heist a human, you can totally just bail on literally everything she needs personally. Hell, it genuinely took me the entirety of my first playthrough to realize that Takamura's vengeance quest and the quest of figuring out your shit with Johnny were technically separate things. It was it wasn't until the end credits where he sent me a message that I realized I had just bailed on him after the parade. I kind of came out of this game with mixed feelings on Takamura, um, and I think partially it's because when he goes to do the reconnaissance on the parade float storage facility, I typically didn't go with him my first playthrough, and I didn't realize that there was an actual, like, bonding connection moment if you do go with him. Um, but Takamura is kind of a weird character because he's both... He's both described as being the super dangerous character. Like he's he's the head of like he's the personal bodyguard of one of the most important people in the world, but he also doesn't know how a flip phone works, right? Like he, he like there's a point where he texts you as like food in Night City, good food in Night City, where to find like Takamuri or whatever in Night City. And he doesn't realize he's texting you. So he's both like highly capable, very dangerous, but also kind of stupid and played for comedy effect. And he just ends up being this kind of weird character that I don't know how to place. 
One step further, you only meet River because Judy lets the Perales family know about you and tells them to reach out to you for help with their little problem of a low-profile death of a high-profile figure. Literally, all of River's questline is totally optional. I don't even mention Carrie. In this, Carrie has his own questline. Um, but even with like the, the 70 hours I think I've been playing at this point, I had never even done Carrie's stuff. I, I didn't know that Carrie was a character yet. Um, so he's not mentioned in this video because when I was making this video, even after 70 hours, I still hadn't encountered him yet. The thing is, though, that if you actually play through all of these stories, no one ever ends happy. Or at least, not totally happy. There's a whole lot of that not surviving the attempt thing I mentioned in these stories because Night City is a bad place. Full stop. Terrible things happen to people who deserve it, who don't deserve it, and anyone else who's caught in the gray. Right from the start, no matter the storyline we take or make on our own, we're told that Night City sucks. It's this was kind of uh, an interesting shot. It was actually kind of a difficult shot because just off screen is um, <laughs> is this woman's nipple. And it's kind of, I don't know, it's a sobering moment about just like the state of moderation and stuff that I can show a character whose like rib cage has been splayed open, her synthetic and organic organs have been harvested, including her eyes. Um, but I had to specifically make sure to not get her nipple in the shot, otherwise I might get in trouble. It's a meat grinder, it's a flesh market where you could catch a stray bullet at any time, and yeah, it is. It always has been. We can see Night City in 2023, and it's shit, and when 2077 rolls around, it's still shit. I really wish we had a little bit more time in 2023. I think it'd be really interesting, especially being in 2023 right now. It's it's a rare thing to encounter an alternate version of reality in the same time you are, right? Like the Halo games take place in like 2552, um, but it's still Earth. Night City takes place in, or Cyberpunk takes place in, you know, it's, it's America, but it's 2077. But we only get a few minutes in terms of Night City in 2023. And you can see, like, Pacifica's cut off, you know, uh, Streets of Watson. Like, it's the same districts. It's the same city. And so I really just want to kind of experience this different world in the same time frame. And it probably always will be shit. But I just can't help but love it, you know? When I play Skyrim or The Witcher, there's few things I want to do less than actually interact with and walk around the untamed parts of the world. But Night City, <laughs> man, Night City just fucking gets me. The lights, the crowds, the fact that every motorcycle is an absolutely unchained Akira slide machine. You sure? Jack, you'd kill me if I got so much of a scratch. So don't get any scratches on that. Fun fact, this is actually the shot that kind of inspired this greater video as a whole. This idea of Mama Wells insisting, like, you take care of the bike, you don't scratch it. But also, the vehicles in this game are not good. <laughs> I love, I love this game. This game was not designed with driving vehicles well in mind. Um, for example, that bit where, that isn't me trying to slide. That was actually just me trying to get to where I was going, and then the thing happened that would just be good for that clip. Um, and that's even with, I have a mod for better vehicle handling. And that is better vehicle handling. The, the bikes in this game are just unhinged in the most fun way. It's the first time I've ever played an open world game that actually felt like it was a world, you know? And look, I know that just beneath the surface, this dude is just a hyper simple AI whose entire existence is walking around with no real place to be up until the exact second that I'm too far away for the game to value rendering them. But I don't think Skyrim even has as many named NPCs as Night City just invented on the fly right here. And I don't care if you think that's an unfair comparison, like, oh, but Skyrim is so old. Stop fucking releasing it then, Todd. A few people in the comments have pointed out that that's, that is a little bit of an unfair comparison, and I think it would have helped if I'd kind of explored that idea a little bit more. Um, the NPCs in Skyrim are definitely more alive, right? They have more personality, more character in general, right? After you've heard the same line from the same voice from the same guard, you know, a hundred times, they start to feel lifeless. But in general, I think Skyrim's NPCs are more alive. The issue I have with Skyrim and its NPCs is when you go to Solitude, like the capital city of Skyrim, there's like 70 people there total. That's that's a village, right? And when you go to Dawnstar, there's like 12 people who live there. 
And if you go to White Run, which is like the, the it's it's referred to in the loading screen little dialogues as like the trade hub for Skyrim. There's like four people who own four carts or a little little stalls. That's not a trading hub. So while the NPCs in Skyrim might individually have more life, the the crowds and the masses of Night City, you know, faceless though they are, make the world feel alive in a way that I've never seen another game match. Both games are good, and both games have NPCs that serve the purpose that the game needs them to serve. Um, but if you actually want to talk about a world feeling alive and feeling lived in, this is the way to do it, I think. When I get a scripted phone call upon leaving a building or having just finished a chat with someone, I just walk, like around the town. When Jackie calls to catch up about my chat with Dex, I can't stop myself, literally cannot stop myself from just walking around this little shopping area. Which is already one of my favorite locations in a game ever, because look at it. I, it's just the walkability of this place. You've got a bunch of little shops all in one place. It's kind of like a little street mall that's vertical instead of spread out. And I love the bridges and the stairs to take you to different areas. It's just, it's absolutely the kind of place I would see myself hanging out at all the time. But I walk around it because that's what I'd actually do. When I get a phone call in my actual home, I basically just wander the entire property while I chat, and somehow it doesn't surprise me that V, as my surrogate in tonight's city, does the exact same thing. This world is just, it's immersive, it pulls me in, it makes me feel like I'm there, that I want to be there, and I know that's such a silly thing, but I'm so not used to it. This idea of actually buying into the world in my open world games somehow feels so brand new whenever I load into Cyberpunk. God, I would go bonkers and yonkers for a VR release because the aesthetics of Night City are- And there's that blimp again. There's only a few shots like this in the entire video, so I did try and um, get these blimps into them, but it's just like the constant reminder of it's always there. This theme is always there. You're not supposed to succeed here. Night City is not a place where people are supposed to thrive. Undoubtedly my favorite in literally any game I've ever played. And I know, okay, I know, that Night City is supposed to represent the hellscape dystopia of raw, unchecked capitalism and megacorps turning into basic politics with gangs in their pockets keeping the streets in check, keeping them exactly as the corporations want, but even after pulling his nephew out of Englewood Farm River- Fun fact, that's one of the words I mispronounce. It's actually Edgewood Farm. Still can't help but comment on the physical beauty of Night City, and I just get it. Because when you really look for it, it's not just the lights and the crowds and the heights, but there's all these little pockets and small places in the city that just defy the city. If anybody's ever found a reason to go to this, like, little Japanese pagoda, um, let me know in the comments. Like, it's a little it's shopping all... area. It's a little shopping area, I think. There's just, like, maybe a, a vendor or two up here. Um, I have no idea why this place is here other than set dressing and making the world feel alive and just being this little pocket. Um, if there's a quest that takes you here for something, please let me know. I'm genuinely curious. Little pockets and small places in the city that just defy the city. When Ev dies, Judy has her put to rest in this little place up east. Judy says the basic area of where it is, but I still had to look it up because I'd never even been in the area. The only reason I ever found to come here was because of Judy's phone call, and it's not even a required story beat, but they still put cool things here to see. There's just something about seeing natural green in Night City that I love, and I love all of these little parting messages. You can find where Alt Cunningham is laid, for example. Or at least, where people think she's laid. If you wander around enough, you can find Ev. She actually shows up here after the phone call. Um, I don't think I showed in the video. But do you remember the Corpo start, that name I told you to remember, Arthur Jenkins? If you come here, he is here. Remember that, the whole Corpo life start, that it's like the, the rival suits have come to purge the department and that means you? Arthur Jenkins was killed, and you can find him here, and his um, tombstone reads something like Arthur Jenkins, loyal to the corporation until the very end, which is just brutal. I know it's a sad place, but I love that there's just this little pocket of green and quiet and solace in a place where that's not really supposed to exist. And I love that if I get on the highway, I can ride out into the desert. And there's a few things to do out here, sure. There's a few seedy motels to interrogate a suit in, some arms dealers just outside proper city limits, an old ghost town that never falls asleep again once you wake it up. I don't know if this really came across in the shot. This is the town where... Um you and Pan Am ambush, um, oh god, what are they called? 
you ambush the rival nomads to get her car back. And the way you do that, in part, is by distracting them by turning power back onto the city. But the thing is, the power never gets turned back off. You don't have the ability to turn the power back off. And so you just end up with this fully powered ghost town um, that never falls asleep again. But mostly I just like to look, watch the city at night. This is one of the places where I think the density of Night City compared with the openness of the Badlands really works. Um, I, I criticize some other games for their massive open worlds with nothing to do in them, but I think having the Badlands really helps work as a as a comparison, I guess, as a contrast. This idea of Night City is so dense and so heavy and so deep, and then all of a sudden, kind of with the flick of a switch, there's just nothing. There's just open desert for miles. And, you know, kind of coincidentally following the theme here, those blimps never go over the Badlands. Those blimps only hover over Night City, and so there's this idea of getting out of Night City gets you away from that theme, that trauma, that overarching idea of you're not going to survive here. And I love the idea of this this desert is a wasteland, but you have a better chance of surviving out here than you do in Night City. And I think using the Badlands as that kind of stark contrast is why the Badlands being so open works, whereas other open world games having, you know, expanses of nothing kind of falls apart. Maybe they named it Night City as a lampshade about how dark the world can be, but sitting out here on this bluff, somehow this place looks like every star in the sky to me. One person made a comment um, that Night City is named Night City because it's named after the founder, Richard Knight, and I do I do know that. Um, that sort of comment is a reference to there's there's in-game lore, and then there's the reason the person writing the lore did that, right? Because Night City is just a dude that was invented by some writers, I assume back in the 80s, because cyberpunk as a as a sort of genre, there was like cyberpunk 2020. I believe was uh, is what it was called back in the 80s when it was a tabletop role-playing game, a, a tabletop board game kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, I assume Richard Knight got invented then, but why did the person, you know, Knight, it was probably called Night City, and then they came up with a reason to call it Night City, and the easiest one is the founder was Richard Knight. But why did they call it Night City? And I, th I think it's because it's that lampshade of this is a dark world, it's dark at night, call it Night City. And I know, a huge thriving city in the middle of a desert, it's all man-made, it's fake, it's a trap with bright lights as a lure to bring in new meat, grind it down, spit it back out. This city is just as fake as your chance of escaping it, and you're not the only one trying. There's a blimp, you're tr talking about trying to pack up your shit and bail? Blimp in the background. You're, n you're not going to leave, if Night City has its way at least. People are desperate to get out of here, from V's street kid beginnings to the entire Pan Am family to Judy to even just random NPCs talking in the street. It really seems like the only people who actually want to be in Night City are the ones responsible for keeping people here as long as possible. This is such a brutal thing to read through, the idea of like six days off a year, or um, I think it's because the that's night core... I don't, it's not the night core. Somebody talks about the idea of like the, your work week being capped at 80 hours, um, 80 hours a week, which is, oh my God. It is. Or maybe if you're Adam Smasher, the city lets you take the mask off and let your outside show what the inside has always been. But I don't think it's a coincidence that Adam Smasher is basically entirely Chrome at this point. Um, I think there's the very clear comparison of, maybe not the clear comparison, how do I want to phrase this? Adam Smasher is such a great villain because he shows what you can be in this world if you throw away your identity. If you throw away this idea that people and our connection to them mean anything and you just want to hurt people, this is the place to do it and that's showcased by Adam Smasher. Adam Smasher was a heartless son of a bitch 50 years ago, and he's still doing it today because if you really just want to be the absolute worst you can be and the dregs of humanity, you can come to Night City and you can be Adam Smasher. Hey, at least there's Neon. 
I think at the end of all things, I just have some really mixed feelings about cyberpunk as a game and as a genre, and mostly with Night City as a world, and it comes with the strange understanding that I'm probably the exact type of person to get pulled into the worst of this type of world. This is such a great scene. Um, while I was getting some B-roll, uh, I, I did a time skip to bring it to day, and a sandstorm had rolled in. And I just love this idea of just some people doing yoga in a park in the middle of a sandstorm. I, I don't know, maybe sandstorms, it's something you get used to, but living where I live, we don't get sandstorms like this. Um, or even anything close to this. And so this is the kind of thing that, like, I would be inside for, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be going outside. And there's just people out here doing yoga. And it's this kind of accidental storytelling of, like, yeah, Night City sucks, you shouldn't be outside, but... The human condition is to get used to things, and eventually I think you get used to the violence and the terribleness of Night City, just like you get used to the sandstorms, and eventually, you know, you've got yoga scheduled for three today, get out there. It's just something that you stop paying attention to. Coming into this game, I think I expected it to be near unplayable. I remember stories from launch about quests just not working, and bugs that would prevent story progression, that would essentially brick your save, and if it wasn't that, it was just the game was just, like, not finished at all. But what I found instead was a story, and a world, and a cast of characters that I really, really like. And sure, it's a little scuffed, but that didn't stop me from binging this game like mad and continuing to play long after I beat it for the first time. I'm really... This was um, the same sandstorm that kind of had the whole orange glow over the city. Um, I was trying to come to like, where would be a great place for like a final shot? And there's just something about Judy being backlit by the sandstorm sun that just, this is a really good shot. It's really pretty. I'm really happy with it. And I think it's just really nice to end the video on a pretty shot of one of my favorite characters from this game. I'm really glad I played Cyberpunk. And I'm really glad CD Projekt Red didn't give up on it. There's some new DLC coming out soon, I'm told. Maybe it's already out by the time this video goes live or when you see it. I know I'm excited for it, and I'll probably have some thoughts on it. I might even make a video about it. If you want, you can subscribe to this channel to catch more videos as they come out, and if you're interested in helping me make this sort of thing a larger, more consistent part of my life, then you can find my Patreon in the description below, or on screen right about now. Hey, speaking of supporting the channel, let's uh, take a look at some numbers really quick. You guys have already been so unexpectedly supportive of just this first project, so it's probably a good idea to talk about the future of this channel and what I plan on using it for. I plan on doing a lot of video essays on this channel. Currently, I'm trying to build myself a schedule of one video a month updated at the end of every month. Um, especially while I'm kind of learning my format and how to use my programs, I think that's a good time frame to allow me to get consistent quality that I'm happy with for each video. In the future, I might be able to pick things up, start doing one every three weeks on a kind of staggered schedule. But for currently, it's one video a month at the end of every month, and I have nine different uh, videos currently planned out, taking us to, I think, like, I don't know, October. This month's video, February's video, uh, because that cyberpunk was supposed to go up in January, oops, uh, February's video is going to be on the game Hades, the roguelike from Supergiant. If you haven't heard of that game, uh, it's okay, we'll talk about it, but uh, I'm a big fan of it right now, um, and I'm especially a fan of the way that the game showcases and highlights your growth and like ability in the game, so I think that's going to be a fun thing to talk about. Going forward, though, I do need to talk a little bit about the financial stability of this channel. Currently, for people doing this kind of video work, with the goal of it being a full-time job, which is what I would like to eventually be able to transition into, there's currently three different avenues that you can pursue. The first of which is YouTube's own partnership program. The brief idea behind this is ads play on your video, regardless of whether or not you are part of the partner program, but when you hit certain milestones on your channel, you essentially get the ability to opt in to the partnership program where you will start getting a cut of the ad revenue. The basic idea behind this is if we give you money from YouTube's perspective, if we give you money, you will keep creating content that more eyes get put on, which means the ads are worth more money. So YouTube in turn makes more money and you get some of that as thanks for 
putting out the content that YouTube makes money off of. We're already over halfway there. It doesn't quite update every day, but we've hit almost 600 subscribers tonight. And if we go to the video analytics and actually look at the overview for the Cyberpunk video, um, it's like two and a quarter or two and a fifth thousand hours, which is halfway to that 4,000 mark. The issue with the YouTube partnership program is YouTube can sometimes be a little finicky on its monetization. Um, for example, about a month ago, a channel called RT Game put out a video that was a compilation. It was essentially just the best of his videos from 2022, and it got demonetized, which is weird because the video was just a compilation of a bunch of stuff that was already on YouTube that was not demonetized. And when he pointed this out to YouTube, um, instead of saying, oh, shoot, our bad, we didn't realize this was a bunch of stuff that was already you know, approved that was already on the on the platform for months, they went back and retroactively deactivated a lot of the monetization on his videos. So YouTube can be a little spotty in terms of the reliability, and you kind of have to play nice with their algorithms and their rules, which can be inconsistent. The second way you can be financially independent here is through sponsorship programs. If you've ever heard somebody talk about Squarespace or HelloFresh or Raid Shadow Legends, um, that's what's going on. The company is paying the creator to talk about their product in their video. And this is super reliable and can apparently be worth a non-insignificant amount of money depending on the size of your channel. The issue is I don't know if it's compatible with the content I want to make. You know, if I, I, I don't want a third party having sway or influence over the content that I'm creating any more than I have to, and I don't want to have to intercut some emotional beat of, you know, I have a complicated relationship with Night City, but my relationship with today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, is rock solid. I don't want to do that. Which leaves one other option. Patreon is a really reliable, solid way where you as the viewer can directly and independently fund content that you enjoy. It is a way to ensure that I can make the videos I want to make without having to undercut the content with, you know, a read for a service I don't care about, or I don't have to necessarily be super, super terrified of YouTube's inconsistencies with its rulings, and it lets you get rewards for directly funding the content you want to see. Um, a few people have already jumped over to lend their support to the channel, which is fantastic. I want to give a quick thank you to the three of you, and I'll put that on screen right now. Let's see if I did that right in post. Um, that kind of support means everything to me, because it helps ensure that I can make these videos for as long as possible, which is my goal regardless of the Patreon account status. I enjoy making these videos. I enjoy talking about the things I love and I want to do it for as long as possible. If you are interested in helping me do that, this is the best way to do it because it helps ensure that this is where my focus can be. But I want to stress, Patreon is not required. It's not expected. I'm going to make these videos regardless for as long as I can. I'm still kind of trying to work out the best incentives and thank yous for the... Uh, three tiers I currently have. So if there's anything you want to see included as a patron, please let me know in the comments and I can figure out ways to include what people are looking for as um, incentives and thank yous. I don't know if I'll be able to ever say appropriately how grateful I feel for the attention you guys have given this video. I've tried in the past to do somewhat similar creative endeavors, and I've never really been met with much success. And I think I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this project probably took around 120 hours, which is a significant amount of time. One of the things about creative endeavors like this is there's a sort of soft correlation between effort that goes into the project and the amount of success or attention the project gets, but it's never guaranteed. There's probably lots of stuff on YouTube that is really, really good, better than what I'm producing, that just never got the attention it deserved. So I'm super grateful to all of you who have come to comment on the video, like the video, leave supportive comments. Oh my god, I cannot get over how kind and supportive everyone has been in the comment section of this video. It means 
everything to me. And for as long as I'm able to, I'm going to do my best to continue making content that is worth your guys' attention and affection. Thank you guys so much.